Good morning and welcome to Connection Church. We are so excited that you've joined us online this morning. Why don't you stand to your feet in your living room or wherever you are and get ready to worship the Lord with us today.
worship you today. We lift your name up in this place, Father. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was born. The precious blood of Jesus Christ. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. sorrows and trade them for joy from the ashes a new life is born Jesus is calling oh come to the altar the Father's arms are open wide forgiveness was born with the is blood of Jesus Christ will come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy 
From the ashes a new life is born
praise. We give you the praise. We thank you that we are never alone. Jesus, that we have you, that you are with us, that you are fighting our battles. Jesus, we give you the praise this morning. I need you to soften my heart and break me apart. Trust what you say that you're good and your love is great. I'm broken inside, I give you my life. I'm
our declaration today, Father. Father, we speak out your truth this morning. We know that no matter how broken we are, no matter how weak we are, that God, your spirit, your spirit can restore, your spirit can be strong within us, God. So Father, we come to you in our brokenness. We come to you in our failings, with our mistakes, Lord, and we lay it before you. And God, we ask that you would begin to fill us today. We ask for more of you, more of your Holy Spirit moving in us. Jesus, you are good and you are faithful. And that truth never changes. Father, we give you all the praise this morning. It is in your holy and powerful name we pray today. Amen. Amen. Well, we are so excited that you've joined us this morning online here at Connection Church. Good morning, Connection Church. Let's continue to our worship with the giving of our tithe and offering this morning. You guys have been so faithful and so generous over the past couple weeks. I know this has been a trying time and a very questionable time as to what's going to happen next, what's going to happen with our jobs and our financial situation, but yet you guys have remained faithful in the God who loves you. You guys have been giving generously, been giving faithfully, and I believe with my full heart that God has been blessing you and your families through this all. He has certainly been blessing Connection Church. So let's continue that faithfulness this morning through our giving of our tithe. We have three ways to give here at Connection Church. You can give online at connectionchurch.cc forward slash giving. That link is in the video description. You have text to give. Text the amount you'd like to give to 84321, and you can send your tithe check directly to the church at 1633 Portage Road, Worcester, Ohio, 44691. Church, continue to be faithful and continue to wait on the blessings of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you so much for what you've done over the past couple of weeks and how your hand is still at work. God, I have faith that you have great things in store, not only for us in this church, but for everyone watching online. God, take, take us in your care. In the weeks to come, as things start to reopen, I pray that you will keep us all safe. Continue to provide for us, Lord God. And today, open our hearts and our minds for what you have prepared within Pastor Tom. Let us hear your words, God, and let us implement them into our lives. In your name. And the church said, amen. Well, good morning, church. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Well, let me, uh, let me just say happy Mother's Day to all of you mothers that are out there. You certainly uh, deserve to be treated extra special today. This is your uh, special day. And uh, no doubt we could probably spend the whole morning uh, just taking time to share stories about our, our moms. I could, I could certainly share plenty of them myself, but... Uh, Unfortunately, uh, we're, we're not going to take time to do that today because we have uh, a series that we have already started. I want to continue on in that, so, uh, so we're going to just move our way into the series. But I wanted to make sure at least to draw attention uh, to Mother's Day a little bit today. I, I hate that we're not able to gather together and you know, hand out a, a Panera cookie to you or do something to treat you special, but we're going to have to, as we often do in our family, we're going to have to float it to a later date. You know, we, we celebrate uh, special days sometimes on the day and sometimes we push them till later. So maybe we'll, maybe we'll do something a little special for mothers uh, a little bit down the road here. But today, we're going to go ahead and jump into our series that we have been in here for the last couple of weeks. I believe this is week three now of the book. Uh, which is all about, all about the Bible. We want to make sure that we get back to basics in our connection with Christ and in our walk with the Lord as we have kind of been forced back into basics in our life and society and relationships and stuff. So we're doing the same thing in our relationship with the Lord. And you can't get back to basics without focusing on uh, reading in the Word of God. So that's what we're doing. Week one, uh, we talked about the reliability and the authenticity of the Bible gave you some different statistics and we talked through some things and, and I addressed five different reasons why the Bible is reliable. First one was that it's perfectly complex. We talked about how it's also incredibly preserved, how it's been inspired by God. It is completely finished and it is our only guide to life and faith. So that was all week one. 
Then last week, we continued on a little bit by answering this question. Hey, why was the Bible written? That's, that's a really important question too. Why did, why did God write and give us the Bible? And so we, uh, we answered that in uh, three different ways. The first was that the Bible is for our instruction. We have to make sure that we understand that. As we read God's word, it's not disconnected from our life, but God is trying to instruct us through his word. The second reason is it's for our correction. If, if we step off track with the Lord, uh, the Bible, the word of God is going to help us get back on track. That's a, that correction element. And then the last point, which I absolutely love, is that the Bible was written as God's love letter to us. We can't miss that, church. If we, if we view it as just some old stale book that's just trying to instruct us and correct us and all that, that's nice. That's part of it. But we can't miss the fact that God is, is communicating above all else his love for each one of us. And so we dealt with that again uh, last week. So that's where we've been. If you missed either one of those uh, two messages, make sure that you tune in and you can go back and watch those on Facebook or at connectionchurch.cc. But uh, today, we're going to go ahead and move forward uh, in with this, uh, with this series. We have a lot of important things to talk about. Uh, but I, I do want to ask this uh, accountability question first. Uh, we asked it last week, and I told you I'm, I'm going to continue to ask this because I want to keep you on track. And so uh, why don't you do this? Turn to somebody next to you in the room right now. I know this is awkward to do, but we're going to keep doing it. Turn to somebody next to you. If you're watching alone, turn to Jesus, right? We're going to go ahead and do that. I want you to share with them what book that you are currently reading in the Bible and about how much time did you take last week reading in the Word of God? Go ahead and turn to somebody. Just take a couple seconds and share that with them. All right, all right. You're welcome to post as well in the comment thread. What book have you been reading? Maybe something that the Lord's been speaking to you. Let's, let's make those comments. That's always fun. We, we can't see each other you know, at church, but we can, we can post our comments. We enjoy doing that. Uh, again, I, wanna, I just want to make sure that you're aware every week during this series, I'm going to keep asking that question. And it's not to make you feel bad if you missed a few days or if, if you forgot to read your Bible for the whole week. You know, I, I don't want to make you feel bad about it. But at the same time, I want to keep you accountable. I want you to know this, this really is a very important thing that we don't just talk about the Bible and talk about how it's important, but we really invest time reading it, studying it, and learning to apply it to our life. If we don't do that, if we neglect it, I promise you, we'll never be the church that God wants us to be. We'll never be the believers and the Christ followers that God wants us to be. It's just, it's part of the basics of your walk of faith. So I'm going to keep asking you about it. God does want us to, uh, he, want us, he wants us to allow his word uh, to penetrate every part of our life. Every moment of every day that we would start to, to think and to craft our thoughts and our ways to align with his. As I said last week, the only way that happens is if we take time reading in his word. He wants us to learn to, to do the things that are talked about in his word, like praying without ceasing, to, to keep worship on our lips and, and flowing through our life and to allow his word to, to rest in our heart, that we would meditate it uh, upon it in our mind. These are things that God communicates to us in the Bible. So we got to read it, study it and apply it, not just on Sundays, but every single day. So with all that said, let's go ahead and get down to business today, talking about our next point in this series. This week and next week, I'm going to be uh, breaking down uh, the books of the Bible. Okay, there's, there's quite a few of them, so I'm going to break them down a little bit. We're going to talk about the Old Testament uh, and the New Testament, the division in both of those, which books are contained in each, and the categories uh, that those books fall into. And so we have a lot to cover uh, with 66 books in total. Uh, we certainly aren't going to have time to talk about each one of them by any means. I'm just going to give you some broad categories. But I am curious... Let me ask a question here. I'm curious, how many of you uh, tend to favor one testament over the other? Okay, do you, do you have a favorite testament, the Old Testament or the New Testament? You know, like, 
like you might love them both and I get that we should love our Bible in its entirety but if you're gonna sit down and read something do you tend to gravitate to the Old Testament the prophets and the stories of old or or do you tend to go to the New Testament why don't you go ahead and post that comment I want to I want to see who who likes which one maybe a little bit better I personally tell you about myself I personally am am more of a New Testament guy. I tend to gravitate uh, towards that. I've certainly read all the books multiple times, but if I'm just going to sit down, I have a little bit of time. I tend to I tend to favor uh, towards the end of the book in the New Testament. I want to read about Jesus. I want to read about the New Testament church and some of the some of the issues that they were having and the way that the apostles were trying to correct those things. I want to read about the life change that we can have uh, through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so I get charged up in the, in the New Testament. But, uh, but that's not to say all of you are probably that way. For instance, my wife, she loves the Old Testament. She loves it. I, I can't tell you. It seems like every, every time I see her reading, she's back there in the Old Testament somewhere. She's doing some study on, on uh, you know, an, an Old Testament uh, word and, and what it meant in the original Hebrew. And she's, she, she gets charged up with those things. And that's good. That's good. I love her for that. And, and so you might notice you favor one over the other But that's not to say that we neglect the other, do we? No, no, no. We have to read the entirety of the Bible. We have to absorb all of that truth because it's all meant to to instruct us, to correct us, to rebuke us, to to train us and lead us in in righteousness. And so we we have all these books for God's intended purpose. And so today, you know, I might be speaking a little bit more to... To those who favor the New Testament, maybe you tend to not read so much in the Old. I want to speak to you and, and I want you to understand today how important that Old Testament is, how we should be reading it, how it's broken down. And so, so that's what we're going to do. 39 books, 39 books. That's what the Old Testament consists of, 39. Now, now some, of, uh, some of, might, might argue uh, that uh, some of those books are a little irrelevant to their life. You know, they're, they're so anchored in, in the law and the do's and don'ts of the Israelites and all these things. But, but I'm going to try to show you today how we can learn to apply those things to our life, even as New Testament followers of Christ. After all, it wasn't, it wasn't just written for the Jewish people. If that were the case, God would not have incredibly preserved it and handed it down throughout the generations all the way to you. God did that intentionally because there's truth contained uh, that is meant for your life and your situations. So never think just because it's old, the Old Testament, that it's not for your New Testament, you know, your life right here. So we're going to talk about that here this morning. There's actually some pretty good reasons why uh, God wants us to read uh, in the Old Testament, and I'm, I'm looking forward to getting that later on in the message. But first, I want to show you the categories, show you the categories of, of the Old Testament. You can break them down into four overarching categories. Now, some, if you do a little research on this, some people break them down even more than that. But I'm just going to try to simplify it. Four categories. The first five books, that's the law, right? It's the, the category known as the books of the law. And uh, you would find those in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Those are all some, those are some pretty long books, a lot of books written about you know, things that don't seem to be all too relevant to our lives as they talk about all these different laws of, of Israel. But, oh, there's some really good stories contained in them as well. And so, uh, first off, let me explain this. The word for this uh, often is called the, the Torah. You'll hear that word that's one of those Hebrew words and the Pentateuch the first five books the Pentateuch that's the Greek word for it penta meaning five and and what we pronounce as tuk meaning meaning scroll the five scrolls they were all written by Moses they outlined the law of God hundreds of times in the Bible you'll see this term law referred to the law God's law the books of the law 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 that it's always referring to these first five books after that comes the what's called the books of history 
Books of history. And these are the next 12 books of the Bible. That'd be Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. So you have these, these 12 books, such amazing stories contained in each one of them. If you've ever read these books, you know that, that you're going to find a lot of history about the up and down, kind of the, the roller coaster ride of the Old Testament uh, you know, followers of God. Seems like one day they would be doing the right thing and honoring God and honoring his law. And then before you know it, man, you, you turn the page, you get to the next chapter and it seems like the wheels have fallen off. Like everything is going wrong. They're not honoring God anymore. Uh, they're experiencing the consequences of that. It's just the ups and downs of God's people. Now they would obey the law for a time and during that as you read their story you're always going to see the blessing of God. It's poured out on them over and over the blessings of God but then as they'd fall away you would see the consequence and the punishment of God begin to to be poured out upon them. It's, It's important to understand that the same God, the God of the Old Testament is the same God that we serve to this day. There are principles that are found there that as we honor God, he honors us. That has not changed. And church, if if we choose to dishonor God, if we choose to walk in willful sin and, and neglect the truths of his word, then at the same time, we will experience the consequences. The fallout from that, which which is basically, I like to think of it like this. There's like an umbrella. Uh, above us that protects us from the from the rains and the storms of this life we can hold on to that umbrella of God's blessing and be protected but when we choose to step out from underneath that and we experience so many of the things that God never he never wanted for us never intended for us he wanted his blessings to cover over us but but that comes with a willingness to stand under his word sometimes when I read the old testament I don't know if you've ever had this feeling, but I'll read the Old Testament. I just, I just want to slap these people on the back of the head and be like, you guys just need to get with the program. You know, why is it you keep making the same mistakes over and over and over again? But then about the time I, I think that way, <laughs> the Holy Spirit normally uh, reminds me in, in my own spirit that I, I can do the same thing. Don't you sometimes do the same thing? over and over again you make the same mistake and you stand on the back end of it thinking why in the world do I keep making this mistake why why can't I seem to honor God better uh, than what I am and and so you know we can hate on the Old Testament followers of God from time to time thinking what is wrong with these people but ultimately I hate to say it but but we're probably uh, not too different than they are We make stupid choices sometimes and we are so dependent upon the grace of God, aren't we church? We are so dependent upon the the goodness and the grace of God which he showed us on the cross when Jesus gave his life for our sins. That now we get to stand under that grace even when we make mistakes, even when we misstep we can say Jesus I need you. I need that love and that grace in my life and God is so good to give it to us. Let me move on here. The next set of books, next set of books is the, uh, what's known as the wisdom books. So you have the books of the law, you have the books of history, and now you have the wisdom books. This would be uh, Job, you got the book of Psalms, that's a really long one, 150 chapters in that one, that's a long one. And then you've got Proverbs, and you have Ecclesiastes, and then the Song of Solomon, or the Song of Songs, sometimes it's called uh, either one. If you want to find encouragement and, and understanding and, and just this reality that, that you're not alone in your struggle. Right? You're not alone. When you walk through seasons where, where you just can't figure out what's going on in life and why, you know, why it just seems like things aren't working out for you, understand, hey, you're not alone. David walked through seasons just like that. You have psalm after psalm after psalm where he is crying out to God saying, deliver me from my enemies and I don't know what's going on. And by the end of that psalm, he's praising God. And if you look at the story of David throughout his life, you'll see somebody who, yeah, he made some mistakes. He wasn't perfect, just like we're not perfect. 
But as he continually turned his heart towards the Lord and let praise be upon his lips, God directed him in his life. It's wisdom, right? God's showing us wisdom through those Psalms, through those Proverbs that Solomon wrote and, and, and those, uh, those wise words to his sons to instruct them and, and, and we can take and learn from those things as well. It's wisdom for living, wisdom for, for loving, wisdom for how to honor God. Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, great places to look. I find it helpful Personally, I find it helpful to read one psalm uh, and one proverb every day. That's a nice little Bible reading uh, tip. You can read wherever you are in your Bible and then just take a couple minutes, go back and read a psalm and read a proverb. It doesn't take too much longer uh, to do that and add that on to your Bible reading. But, uh, but I found that very encouraging over the years to do that. And conveniently, uh, a lot of the psalms are really short. And uh, there's one proverb for every day of the month. It's 31 of them. So you can just read one every day. And when you get to the end of the month, you just start back over again. And you just begin to read those over and over and over again throughout your life. Now you might be thinking, man, pastor, <laughs> if I read the, the, the proverbs, those chapters over and over and over again, I would get to the point where I'd probably get a little bit bored of it. I mean, I'd be able to I'd be able to tell you what those were without even having to read them. I mean, I, w- I would know what they are with my eyes closed. I would say, you know what? You might be onto something there. That's, a, that's exactly the place that God wants you to get. That you wouldn't even have to even open the book anymore. That you would just be able to think about those Proverbs and they would begin flooding over your mind and over your spirit, guiding your life. It takes repetition to get to that place, doesn't it, church? takes an investment of our time and our willingness to sacrifice other things and say, you know what, I'm going to give the extra few minutes. I'm going to read that proverb today and I'm going to let it get into my spirit. The last category, <clears throat> last category, so got books of law, books of history, books of wisdom, and last category, the 17 books that range all the way from Isaiah to Malachi are known as the prophets. Okay, the books of of the prophets. You have the major prophets and the minor prophets in there, but they're all, they're all good. The Old Testament prophet tended to be revealed uh, during times of crisis. If you follow the, the story of Israel, things would start going wrong, right? They're, they're, they're moving in the wrong direction, away from God's uh, path and plan, and all of a sudden God raises up this prophet to speak to them. You've got stories uh, through Isaiah and through Jeremiah and, and, and Daniel and all these just amazing prophets. And they're always set in the context of difficult times. Crisis moments, uh, difficulties and complexities that seem so far beyond the ability for anyone to handle. So many times the people of God, the Israelites, are in captivity. They're not even living in freedom. They're in, in bondage and, and God is trying to speak to them. And draw them out and give them hope during those seasons. But through the prophets, uh, God speaks all sorts of words of wisdom and direction. And yes, uh, many times words of correction. These men would remind the people of the covenant promises of God. And the consequences of falling away from that. They would do that time and time again. And they would also speak prophetically. It's a big thing about a, a prophet's ministry is to speak prophetically about events that had not yet taken place. And so they would, they would do that in an effort to warn the people and also encourage the people to honor God. Um, many of the prophecies, we've talked about this before, that there are so many prophecies about the coming Messiah, right? About Jesus that were spoken in the Old Testament. And then Christ came and, the, and he fulfilled all of them perfectly. Right? That's one of the beautiful things about these, these books of the prophets. You can go back and see where Jesus is foreshadowed and, and these, these words that the prophets spoke that now as we understand the full context of them, as you read through, you're like, Hey, they're talking about Jesus. They're talking about the Messiah right here. And that, that prophet didn't even realize it at the moment, but they were speaking of a man who would come 
and who would redeem humanity, the same man that you and I praise every week, the same man, Jesus Christ, who our hope unto eternity is placed upon. An amazing thing. I love, I love stumbling across those verses in the Old Testament where I can put my finger on and say, that's my Savior. They're talking about Jesus. So that's how the Old Testament breaks down. 39 books, four different categories, all very important. Uh, certainly all worth our time to read. If you have books in the Old Testament that you haven't yet read, make it a priority to do so. Make some notes on your, on your calendar. Put it in your phone. Say, you know what, I'm, I'm going to designate the, you know, the, the month of July and I'm going to read this book or that book. You know, be intentional about it. You know, the things that we're not intentional about normally don't happen. Okay, so take it serious. This is God's word to you. It is your life. It's your pathway to, to knowing how to honor him. Don't be flipping about it. Let's be intentional and make sure that we do what God wants us to do. To read, to study, and to apply. I mean, could we skip those first five books? Let's be honest. Could we, could we just skip over them and just take all of our time reading in the New Testament? I mean, yeah. yeah we, we could do that. We could get the, all, all the great stuff about Jesus, and that would, be, that would be fantastic, but we would miss so much. We would miss things like, uh, you know, Jesus said this in Matthew 5. He talked about how he didn't come to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. Right? If, you, if you don't read the Old Testament, you don't even know what he's talking about. What were those laws? What were the prophets speaking? Right, you lose that context. Or what about this? We could we could pass over the, the books of history, you know, and just thinking, oh, that's just all about history of Jewish people. That doesn't really apply to me. But, but if we would do that, church, we would miss the unfolding of God's story through the generations and how he diligently rewards those who diligently seek him. And that's, that's an amazing truth. What about the, the books of wisdom? Hey, we could skip over those, just read about Jesus and just focus on that. But, but then we would miss the fact that so many of the teachings that Christ gave, they were based out of things that have already been written in these books of wisdom. His teaching were, were fueled by the word of God. You can go back and read those in their original context. Or what about that last set, the prophets? Hey, why, why don't we just speed past those? Let's, let's not take time on all those prophetic books. But the problem is, if we do that, we would miss how Christ is the fulfillment of those prophecies. Right? That, that Christ is the fulfillment of God's plan and purpose and promise to humanity because all through those prophetic books, Jesus is being described. Jesus is, is being pointed to. And then he shows up generations later and we get to read about the fulfillment of each one of those prophecies. This is an amazing, amazing thing. So, in other words, it's all connected. It's all important, right? It's, it's all worth our investment of energy and time. Now, now that I have taken time to explain uh, the categories, I want to shift gears just a little bit. We're going to step into something else for the remainder of our time this morning. And I want to begin to answer a question. Uh, and this is the question. All right. How should I read the Old Testament? How should I read it? Because if we just read it like it's an encyclopedia or a dictionary, like if we're just reading it to gain some information, then we kind of we miss some things. So how should we be reading it and applying it to our life? After all, this, uh, the, these, these 39 books they're really all about Jewish laws and Jewish history and, and, and Jewish prophecies and promises. So, so why is it important for us as Christians in this day and age, why is it so important that we take time to read it and how should we do that? So I've got, I've got multiple answers uh, for that. But first... Let me ask you this question. Let's get thinking on the same page here. Let me ask you this. How many of you have ever read a mystery novel before? 
You ever read a, a mystery, you know, a book? Actually read a book. I know some people are like, I don't read books. Okay, so if you don't read books, let me ask this. Have you ever watched a movie that was like kind of a, a mystery of, of some sorts? Maybe it just kept you guessing uh, all throughout and you weren't sure what was going to happen all the way as it led up to the end of that movie. I tend to, I tend to think about... Um, uh, there's this one movie called Now You See Me. It's based on like uh, magic tricks and different things like this. And it caught my attention. I watched this movie and I'm telling you, I didn't know what was going to happen like the whole time. All the way to the end, I'm like, I don't know where this movie is going until, until the great reveal at the end. And they kind of show you all the clips and show you how it all worked out. I thought that was an interesting movie. Now, I want you to think about this just for a second. Think about how confusing it would be if you, if you uh, instead of reading the whole mystery book or instead of watching the whole uh, movie, you just flipped to the last couple pages and read that. Or you just fast forwarded to the, to the last five minutes and just watched the end. I'm mean, sure you... You might be able to get the, the whodunit moment, you know, you figure out, oh, it was this guy who did it, but, but you wouldn't have the context for that storyline. You wouldn't know why it took place or all the details that led up to it. You wouldn't fully grasp why. Without all the details that lead up to the, to the great reveal, it kind of loses its punch. It loses its, its impact. And I would say, church, the, the same is true when it comes to the word of God. We should view the Old Testament in, in a similar lens. I mean, sure, it was written to to Jewish people and it contains their laws and, and prophecies, but, but without it, church, without it, we won't be able to grasp the, the full story of God and the unfolding of the redemption of mankind. We certainly won't be able to appreciate the great reveal, right? What's, what's talked about in, in the New Testament as the mystery of God, right? It's the, it's the, the greatest mystery of all, uh, of all time, that the Son of God himself, Jesus Christ, would be, would be sent by the Father to earth, would conquer over the dominion of darkness, not, not as a warrior, not as a conquering king as so many would have assumed would take place. No, he would, he would come as a suffering servant. He would win victory by dying and then raising to life again. It's the great reveal, the mystery of God, the one that no one, even, even Satan, didn't see coming. What an amazing thing. So with that in mind, and because we understand that the Old Testament gives context for that story, with that in mind, let's understand that we have to learn how to read the Old Testament so that we can appreciate the gospel truth for what it is. Let's answer this question. How are we supposed to read it? How are we supposed to read it? Because admittedly, uh, it can be a bit confusing, especially if you're using uh, older translation. I mean, if you read out of the King James, let's say, there's a lot of these and thous and words that we don't use anymore. And I mean, it can be confusing sometimes to read the, especially the Old Testament. But I'm not really talking about that so much. I'm not even uh, talking about like how should we read it is in which books should you start with and in what order should you read it or what interpretation should you use. I'm not talking about any of those things right now. I mean, those are all worthwhile questions. I just, we're not gonna take time uh, to deal with them this morning. I wanna talk specifically about the confusing aspect of the Old Testament and the fact that it was written to Israelites and not us. Right? It was written to a Jewish people uh, not us New Testament Christians, which means that the hundreds of promises, I mean hundreds and hundreds of promises contained in the Old Testament, we have to figure out how to understand those. We have to figure out how are we going to handle those promises correctly and make sure that we're, we're standing on them appropriately here in the 21st century uh, follower of Christ. Now, there's an old Sunday school song. If you've been around the church a long, long, long time, you might uh, remember this song back in the day. It says, every promise in the book is mine. Every chapter, every verse, every line. That's the name of this 
Uh, that's, the, that's one of the lyrics from this song. And I say, hey, that's a nice thought. That's a nice little catchy line in a Sunday school uh, song for kids. It's just rhymy enough to be remembered by a child. I like that. Every promise in the book is mine. Every chapter, every verse, every line. But, but then I thought, is, is that really true? Like, is that really true? Is every promise in the Bible for you and me? Here and now, like word for word, can we just take those promises and just make them our own? It's a good question. And it, it again, it follows, it backs up this question we're already asking. How are we supposed to read the Bible? Because there are so many promises in the Old Testament. We need to understand, are these promises really for us word for word? Can we take them and, and claim them as our own? Well, the obvious answer to that, church the obvious answer, if you've taken time to read your Bible, the answer is no. No, I mean, as much as I would love to say, and it certainly would be easier just to say yes, the answer to that is no. There are plenty of promises that are recorded in the Old Testament uh, that really weren't for us. They were, they were specific. They were given to an individual or they were given to a, a people group for a specific moment in time. Trying to say that that applies to us and that we can just take that word for word and just drop it into our life is really, it's actually pretty ridiculous if you think about it. For instance, let me give you one of these. For instance, let's, let's look at uh, Joshua 1, 2 through 4. Matter of fact, we haven't had a chance to shout out for the word of God yet. Let's go ahead, let's give a nice loud connection church shout as we turn to Joshua 1, 2 through 4. Woohoo! There you go. Joshua 1, two through four. Uh, this isn't like one that you're going to want to underline or anything. I'm just using this as an example uh, for us and how not every promise can be taken word for word. But way back there in the Old Testament, you're in Joshua chapter one. Here's what it says. Arise, go over this Jordan. Uh, that's not an individual, by the way. Jordan would be a river, okay? Go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I am giving to them, to the people of Israel. Now listen to this promise, okay? Listen. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, just as I promised to Moses. You're like, yes, that's good. That's a promise of God right there in the Word. And then it says, from the wilderness in this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea towards the going down of the sun shall be your territory. Woo, that's, that's a great promise for the people of Israel. But seriously, what are we supposed to do with that? Right, I mean, when, when we read that, what are we supposed to do with that? Like you, you soccer mom that's out there, you, you Gojo you know, employee, you like, I mean, what about the kids? What about the third grader at Keene Elementary School? Like what are, what are we supposed to do with this promise? We live in Worcester, Ohio, here in central, central Ohio, middle of America. We don't live in the Middle East, right? I mean, and that's by choice. Most of you have chosen not to live in the Middle East. And I'm per pretty sure none of you want to go and claim and live in the land of the Hittites. Like no one woke up this morning thinking, man, I really hope that God gives me a promise so I can go claim some land in the Middle East. No one thought that, right? So, so what do we do with this? I mean, sure, some of us might want a better or bigger land. We might want a better house, better neighborhood to live in. Maybe we can try to find a little parallel here or there, but I, I mean, I highly doubt that's gonna lead anybody to say, okay, so I'm gonna go start walking around in somebody else's yard with my shoes off, you know, so that every place that, that the soles of my feet touch, I can claim is the land of God. So you're gonna go walk around in your neighbor's yard with your shoes off. I mean, if you do that, you're probably gonna get the cops called on you. You're like, it's, that's just weird. You know, you, we can't do these things. Now, when we look at that verse, no one in here thought to do that, right? No one, no one thought to do that because we understand that we, just intuitively as we read that, we understand that promise wasn't intended word for word for us. It wasn't given to New Testament Christians. It was given in the Old Testament to the people of God for the specific moment that they were in. So how do we learn 
to decipher the difference. That's one example of many, many. How do we decipher the difference? How do we make sure that we're applying the right promises to our life so that we are standing in the fullness of God's word and God's goodness and his promises while at the same time correctly handling them? Okay, and those, that's a good question. How do we read the Old Testament? We need to understand this. So let's take these last few minutes. I'm only going to scratch the surface of this as we head towards a close this morning. There are only three things that we need to do. I'm going to touch on them quickly. Three things that we have to do if we want to make sure that we handle the Old Testament promises correctly and still learn to apply them to our life appropriately. First thing is this. We have to learn to apply the promise to Israel first. You got to do that, okay? You can't just jump past that part and just try to apply it to your life. Apply the promise to Israel first. Since we already read this promise in Joshua 1, I'm going to keep using that here as as our example. We already established that uh, the word for word fulfillment doesn't apply to us. Again, we're not trying to go conquer the land of the Hittites today. Like that's, it, it wasn't for us. So does that mean that we just take that verse and just chalk it up as irrelevant? Do we just totally skip over and say, well, that has nothing to do with me, along with so many other verses that were given to Israel that don't appear uh, to have anything to do with me. So I'm just gonna scratch those all out of my Bible. They are absolutely irrelevant to me. Well, I, I certainly hope not. I hope that you don't take that approach because if we do that, we're going to miss out on a lot of truths that God does have for us. If we do that with all the Old Testament uh, promises that seem to be disconnected from our 21st century central Ohio lives, we're going to miss out on some of the most amazing truths and blessings that God wants to pour into our lives. So instead instead of just skipping over them, what we have to do is look at them the right way. Read them the right way. And that always starts by looking backwards. Okay, don't look straight at you. Don't look at forward in your life and how you can apply it. Don't do that yet. Not yet. Start by looking backwards. Learn to apply the promise first to who it was given. And who was it given to first? The people of Israel. It's a good place to start. Now that's not too hard to remember when you read a promise like Joshua 1. Because again, None of us wanted to go conquer the land of the Hittites this morning, so we have no problem saying, okay, that was for Israel first. We do that almost without thinking about it. But what happens happens when it's a promise that we do want to claim, like we do want is ours? That's when we can, it can get a little bit dicey and we got to make sure we handle it correctly. Like what about 2 Chronicles 7, 14? That's a great verse. Many of you are familiar with it. You know, this is the type of verse that gets put on posters and, you know, printed on coffee mugs. Like, this is a really, really good one. Here's what it says. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and heal their land. Wow. Wouldn't you agree? That's a fantastic verse. I love, I love it. I've probably heard that verse applied to uh, the, the church in America and the nation of America a million times. Like we love to, to quote that verse. But the question is this, what right uh, do we have to claim that promise? What right do we have to claim that promise? Are we handling that, that promise and the word of God correctly? Uh, is, it, is it even for us? Because let's not pretend that the prophet when that was penned or when that was spoken that he was thinking about America 2020 because that that was not the case. He wasn't thinking about that in that moment. This was spoken to Israelites generation upon generation, thousands of years ago. So what do we do? What do we do? How do we handle this correctly? Well, where do we start? I already told you, we go to step One, you have to learn to apply the promise to Israel first. We have to understand that that promise had a very clear and present context and an application that we can't just ignore. It was given to someone in a moment. Why? Why was it given to them? 
You have to take time to read and to study and dive into that verse. It wasn't just generic. And it was spoken on purpose to that people group in that situation. You got to learn from the story. See, God recorded that story, including that verse. He did so on purpose for our benefit. Sometimes it was to correct us, sometimes to rebuke us, sometimes to encourage us, sometimes just to to train us up and to fuel our faith. There's always a reason why it's been written and every promise and every verse in the Old Testament is, is the same. We gotta take time to figure out what that was. So once you do that, once you look at verses like that and say, okay, I'm starting with Israel. I'm applying it to them first. I'm understanding that in the, in the scope of the story of God. I'm trying to get, I'm getting a good grasp on that. I've done step one, then, and only then can you move on to step two. You wanna know how to read the Bible, right? How to understand these promises. You start by applying it to Israel, then you go to step two and you begin to translate the promise. That's what step two is, translate the promise. Your second Second Corinthians, here's one out of the New Testament. We haven't read many New Testament verses today. Second Corinthians 1.20 says, for no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through them, the amen is spoken by us, speaking of the church, right? By us to the glory of God. To the Old Testament, Old Testament promises, uh, they might have been given to the people of Israel, all right, that's, that's the original context of those promises, but they always indicate something about the character of God, don't they? All those promises give us glimpses of who God is, what his character is, and what his plan for his people and the world would be. Now, since we know that God never changes, right, that's revealed in, in the Bible as well. God is the same yesterday, he's the same today, he's the same every day that we'll face. God never changes. So what that means is that his character doesn't change, right? His plans and his purposes, they don't change. They're not shifting like shadows. They have been set. So what that means is we got to learn to translate the promise, to find the, the parallel in our present day for that promise that was spoken so many generations before. For instance, let's look back at Joshua 1 again. Let's get back to that. What does this promise of obtaining the land, cross over the Jordan, go set the sole of your feet upon the ground and claim this land. What does that show us about the character of God and the plans of God? Well, how about this? How about this for for translating it? God is an all powerful God. Wouldn't you say amen to that, right? God is all, he is almighty and he, that's, that's the kind of God that we serve. God could do anything that he wants to do. We know that about God. He's not limited by anything or anyone. God can do whatever he wants. Yet, when we see this promise given to God's people, about going in and and, and taking the land of the Hittites and so on and so forth. Notice, it doesn't say that he's going to go in and that God's going to do all the work. No, if you read the story, you see that Joshua is being led to be strong and courageous and to lead the people of Israel across the Jordan and do the hard work of claiming the land. Yes, they were sent by God, but God wasn't going to do all the heavy lifting for them. He would support them and encourage them, give them the strength needed, but the people of God were going to have to do the work. So I look at that and I say, okay, if that was kind of the heart of that promise and what's being, what, what's being revealed about the character and plan of God, is that still the way that God works today? Notice how we're, we're applying it, we're, tra- or excuse me, we're translating it. Is that still the way God works today? Sure, God can make things happen, Uh, Anything he wants to, he can make it happen. He doesn't have to use us, us Christians, and involve us in the process. For instance, we are constantly talking about reaching people for Jesus, right? Being being evangelists and sharing the word of God, right? I encourage you guys all the time, make sure the name of Jesus is on your lips. Look for opportunity to speak his name to people and to encourage them that they would come to know Jesus Christ as their savior. 
Right? We get that encouragement all the time. Now, does God really need to use us in that process? I mean, think about it. God could do whatever he wants to do. He's almighty. He's all powerful. He could, he could just arrange for somebody to, to find a Bible or find something or other. They can pick it up and read it on their own and come to know Jesus without another individual being involved in the process at all. But wouldn't you agree that's rare? Wouldn't you agree? I bet if you shared your story right now with somebody, and, and don't because you don't have time and I'm still talking, but if you did, I bet... I bet 99.9 of you have a story that involves somebody who witnessed to you, who shared about Jesus, and that led you to a decision point where you surrendered your life to him and began living for him. It involved someone. That's just the way that God often works. Most of the time, doesn't he call us to be strong and courageous? Doesn't he call us New Testament followers of Christ to be his witnesses and his ambassadors, salt and light to this world? So that if we would, if we would take time to understand that the promise that God gave to Israel, uh, that they would be strong and courageous and take the land, isn't it very similar to the promise and the charge that God has given us to be strong and courageous, to be ambassadors and witnesses for him and and to go and and take our communities for Christ and to take our our families and our friends and our co-workers and and to share with them the good news of the gospel. Doesn't Doesn't it ring very similar? Church, what I'm talking about is taking time to translate the Old Testament promises based on the unchanging character and plan of God. Because I promise you, if you do that, you will be amazed at how often you can find a parallel to your life, to which which Christ is the yes of that promise, and to which you and I, the church, become the echo, which is the amen, and we say, yes, Jesus is the fulfillment, and he's using me and blessing me, and he, all of these things, they tie in together, though they were originally given in a totally different context to the people of Israel, you will see so many times it fulfilled in your life, if you're willing to look. So we might not be able to claim... <clears throat> the word for word uh, effect of the promise uh, as it wasn't specifically uh, given to us, but you better believe that the entirety of the Bible reveals a God who never changes. So, so if he can hear from heaven, right? Let's think back to that Second Chronicles verse that we love so much and that promise we want to claim so much. So If in that context, if God can hear from heaven, if he can forgive sin, if he can bring healing in response to the people of God submitting and repenting uh, and praying, then why would he not do the same for us? If God is unchanging and if we have called on the name of Jesus, why would he not do the same for us? us so was that promise word for word given to us no no it wasn't but that doesn't mean we can't take it and translate it so we understand it in our context and that leads us to the last step it's it's just a natural outflow it just blends right in together with the second right this is this is the way uh, Dr. Ward this is a theologian uh, this is the way that he termed this And I like this, this third step. He said, apply the translated promise to the grafted in olive branches. I like that. I like that, which admittedly is a little bit confusing. So let me explain that. Uh, It sounds strange, but the Bible talks about us, New Testament believers, us Christians, as being like olive branches that have been grafted in to the people of God, the Israelites. We've been grafted in like a branch grafted into that vine. So in the same way, the promises and the blessings of God that were given to them have also been given and now flow through us because we are grafted in to the vine, to that olive branch. I like that, that terminology, that picture that we can think about. Matter of fact, let me read this to you. It's in Romans 11, New Testament, right? Romans 11, 17 and 18. 
says, if some of the branches have been broken off and you through a wild, or though a wild olive shoot have been grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing sap from the olive root, don't consider yourself to be superior to those other branches. If you do, consider this. You don't support the root, but the root supports you. Hmm, that's, that's some pretty big stuff. If you really wrap your mind around, there, uh, around those verses, what we're being told is that, and we were these wild olive shoots. We had, we had no part or place in the promises of God, but through Jesus Christ, we have been taken and grafted in to all of these amazing promises of God. All those promises given in the Old Testament, we now are nourished and flourished through them. So what would we say this? I would say this. Even though the Old Testament promises aren't for us, doesn't mean that they aren't to us. Okay, that's a very important difference. We have to understand. They weren't, they weren't for us initially. They were for the Israelites. But now, through Jesus, they have been given to us. The New Testament church of Jesus Christ encouraged and, and nourished in the translations of, of these Old Testament promises. Just like sap of an, of an olive tree is for all of the branches, even those that were grafted in later. Let me close with this last verse. A little verse I think that's, that sums this idea up. I think it helps us to know how to understand how to read the Old Testament, how to translate it, how to apply it, all these things we've been talking about. Uh, let, let me read this for you. It's in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12. Uh, let me, and actually it kind of skips through up to 22, but we're going to start in verse 12. It says, remember that at that time, okay, speaking of before salvation, at that time, you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise. Covenants of the promise. That's all, that's all these promises we're talking about. The promises of the Old Testament. You were foreigners to all those, separate from them. You were without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Now skip to verse 19. It says, consequently... You're no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. Build on the foundation of the apostles, that's New Testament, and prophets, that's Old Testament, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. And church, many of you know it's because of verses like that that I begin every week by saying it's good to be in the house of the Lord. So I'm gonna end this message by saying the same thing. Church, isn't it good to be in the house of the Lord? Amen? Amen. Would you stand to your feet? I'm gonna close in a word of prayer with you. So wherever you're at, Living rooms, wherever, unless you're driving, please don't stand. That's dangerous. Go ahead and stand to your feet and let's go ahead and bow our heads. Close our eyes. Let's, let's pray. Jesus, I thank you for today. Thank you for this gift of, uh, of Mother's Day. For all the mothers that are watching uh, and listening right now, I pray a special blessing over them. Lord, that you would go before them, that you would give them patience in every way as they deal with their children. Uh, Lord, that you would just have your hand upon their life. Bless all the mothers today on this special day. And Lord, I pray that you would uh, just seal the words that we've talked about today in our hearts, in our mind, and our spirit. That we would learn how to look at your Bible appropriately, read it correctly. That we would know how to take all those beautiful promises and apply them in our life. Lord, I thank you for each one of them. They are life to us. They guide us. I thank you for your word. And Lord, I pray over all those that are listening, if there are any that don't know you, if there are any that are, that are still stumbling through their life, they're trying their best, but they're falling short and, and they realize now that, that they need you, Jesus. They need to submit their heart and their life to you. Oh Lord, you have told us in your word, it's so simple. All we need to do is 
is belief. We need to believe in our heart. We need to confess with our mouth. And then we're saved. Lord, I thank you for that truth. Matter of fact, we're going to, we're going to do that right now with every head bowed and every eye closed. If you would say, I, I want Jesus to be my Lord and leader, savior of my life, would you just begin to repeat this prayer after me in your own words? Just begin to say, Jesus, I'm, I'm a sinner. I've made mistakes. Uh, Jesus, you know that, that, that I'll probably make a lot more, but I, I choose you. Jesus, I choose you in my life right now. I recognize that you're the son of God. Jesus, you died on the cross and you rose again. I accept that truth. Jesus, I ask that you would wash over my sins. Make me clean. Jesus, give me victory in my life from this day forward. I surrender to you. And Lord, I pray as we've done that right now, Lord, that you would just begin to do a supernatural work in all those who believe that and prayed that. And Lord, that that the rest of us, us us believers, Lord, that have known you for for years and years and years, Lord, I pray that you would give us a fresh passion for your word, even this week. And as we we read more and take in more of your truth, God, let it lead us into victory every single day. And Jesus, we pray all these things in your awesome name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, church, for tuning in. I hope you have an amazing week. I look forward to uh, speaking again next week as we continue on with our series. God bless.